it's my pleasure to chair this session, the session on uh, clean resources, stories of action, innovation, and cool science. Uh, my name is Trevor Stuthridge. I'm the Executive Vice President for FP Innovations. FP Innovations is the world's largest not-for-profit research organization focused on forestry, wood products, pulp and paper, and uh, bioproducts. Uh, we're based here in Vancouver and in Montreal. Uh, and we were created 10 years ago this year to be the innovation hub for applied research and deployment of technologies into the industry across Canada. In today's session, we're going to hear 12 speakers who are going to talk around opportunities for clean resources and the natural resource sector's opportunities for innovation. Uh, BC is uh, heavily invested in the clean tech area, as we know from yesterday's announcements for funding, and more generally in terms of what the natural resources sector is doing to become uh, a world-leading organization uh, or, or uh, sector. Uh, we recognize globally uh, in the natural resources area here in, in British Columbia for our climate change leadership, uh, innovative practices in terms of uh, processing and, and uh, environmental management and creating technologies that improve environmental performance and productivity. Um, it's an exciting time to be involved in this sector in the province, in my opinion. BC has some significant advantages in natural resources and in innovation and, and technology that we should take advantage of. And so over the next few hours, we're going to hear from across the natural resources sector, all elements of it, uh, across uh, mining, energy, and of course, forestry. Um, you'll see more about what's going on in the mobile app if you, if you are using it. Um, I hope what you really learn from this, uh, this uh, session is that this is a highly innovative, uh, technolog technologically advanced uh, area, natural resources, uh, where we are at the leading edge of advanced technologies and big data process engineering and, and, and uh, manufacturing. Um, and uh, with that, I'll uh, pass this on to our first speaker. So this will be by John Thompson. He's a consultant with Petra Science Consultants. And he's a world professor of environmental balance for human sustainability at Cornell University. And his talk will be on Imagine If, a clean resources perspective, which will set the tone for the rest of the session. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Trevor, and thanks very much for those of you who are here. I was hoping we'd have a the room full of excited people, but we'll have to see if we can generate enough excitement that it'll permeate out into the corridors. So I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me to give this talk and for giving me my title. It's practically the most interesting title I've ever had because it, give it gives me completely infinite degrees of freedom to say whatever I want, and that's always a, probably a bad thing. But anyway, here we go. So what I'm going to do in this talk, I'm going to talk a little bit about a vision for the future. I'm going to do some imagining with you and hopefully get you involved in doing some imagining. And, but I want to start by just uh, a little refresh on why things were going to change. I mean, I think most people who are involved in the business know that there's an immense amount of change going on and that's going to continue. But it's important just to get a sense of what that change is all about, why that's going to push us to, new, new, to do new and different things. So first and obviously most important is the demand driver, and that's not going to change in our business. That's not to say it's easy or easily understood, because it'll be volatile, it'll have its ups and downs, and fluctuations in prices and so on. But population, standards of living for people on the planet, the basic ingredients of life come in many cases, and if not most cases, from natural resources, and that'll continue to drive us forward. We also live in a world which is undergoing what some people have termed the fourth industrial revolution, the digital age of digital transformation, and that is affecting natural resources as much as it's affecting everybody else in, uh, in all sectors. So it affects us in the times of products, the kind of demands that are being put on us, but it also offers us all sorts of technologies that change the way we actually do our, do our business. So we are as much part of that fourth industrial revolution as, as any other sector. And of course, our sector is highly, our, this is the collective sectors of natural resources are highly competitive. We live in a very competitive world. BC has to compete against the very best all over the world. And this, of course, is a significant driver. So that's the, those are all the positives. The negative side of the equation is natural resources are exceedingly complex. And for those of you, all of us in the room, and perhaps some of you who would like to know more about it, that's the world we live in. We're used to it, but other people are not so used to it. And it's therefore a hard market to enter for research and startup companies who are trying to understand the niches that they can operate in. So the complexity covers all aspects of the businesses listed on the, on the screen. And last, and perhaps in many ways most important for those of us who are in the business, is that the societal expectations around what we do in the resource sector, in the natural resource sector, continue to increase. And I would argue that's a good thing. They should increase, and we have to match it, and I think we can and will exceed those expectations, but it's always going to drive us 
to, to improve, to be better than we already are. So those are the significant drivers. I don't think anybody hopefully would dispute these. These are the reasons that change will happen. And if change is going to happen, therefore, we have to think about what that's going to look like. So I come from the minerals and mining and metal sectors. So this slide and the next two or three slides are more focused on that. And then towards the end of my talk, I'm going to try and enlarge the scope a little bit to natural resources and resources in general. So coming from the mineral resources, we in the mineral resources will deal with the Earth. And the most important things that you need to know about the Earth is that it's extremely complex. It's highly heterogeneous. It varies all over the place. And it's made of minerals. Now, this may sound like a strange thing to say, but let me explain quickly what I mean. A mineral is a chemical compound that has a very specific structure. We don't mine metals, or very, very rarely in our business do we get the luxury of mining metals. We mine minerals. And then we have to extract the metals of interest from the minerals. And that's the complexity that we, that we have to deal with in our, in our business. And that's the most significant underlying fact. We inherit that from the world, from the Earth. And the Earth is a very special planet. And we inherit these ingredients, and we have to try and deal with them. Mineral resources in general are concentrated in very specific places all over the planet, in BC and elsewhere. And we don't, in spite of 100 years or so of research, geological, geoscientific research, we don't fully understand why things are where they are. We have to live with that. And that's why discovery is a challenging business. We can't just walk out and turn up the next great ore deposit, the next great mine, to meet the demand of the future. It's a complicated task that we have in front of us. And even when we found something, if we're lucky enough, for those of us who've been lucky enough to actually make a discovery, it we then turns out that the discovery was made, that piece of rock in the ground that we're going to now mine, is itself highly heterogeneous, incredibly variable, and incredibly complex. And that complexity challenges all our processing. And if we get that processing wrong in terms of the concentration of the metals in it or the concentration of deleterious elements that are in it or the physical properties of it, that can affect all the way downstream into the metal processing facilities and even into products if we don't foresee the problems that we're having to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. So in essence, we have poor, in our business, we have poor control of the inputs. If you're making shoes, you know what you're putting in a factory in order to make shoes. We don't have that luxury. We have to take the material that comes out of the ground, highly variable, highly complex, and deal with that complexity, and then turn it into the materials that we're going to need for society going forward. So that's the, that's the complex side of our picture. So now, if you take that vision of the beginning, and I said that all this change is happening, it's going to drive us, and you take what I just said about the complexity, here now is a scenario of what BC in the mining space, and the natural resource mining space in particular, is going to look like in 2040. So that's 23 years out. I have no idea whether I'm right or not. The one thing you know for sure about any scenario is you're wrong. So I put that out there. This is wrong. But there are elements here that I hope you can buy into. So I would say that in 2040, British Columbia is a chosen provider of branded commodities that come from natural resources. That's not just mining. That's also wood products and other forms of energy and so on. If we're branded, that has to be based on performance. And that performance will be both technical, it will be environmental, and it will be social. We have to meet all those, those ingredients in order to be branded as a, as, a, as a, if you like, a class A product of whatever the type we're thinking about. But if it's branded, that also requires that there has to be some kind of certification that the industry and society has to buy into, and that therefore has to also be some kind of tracking of the products once they leave the site of production and go to wherever they're going in the world. So that's a complicated piece to develop, but I think it's one that we could get our heads around. And I think it's going to happen regardless of whether we want it to. So it's better that we embrace it and drive it than get it, have it drive over us. In 2040, we're going to have the world's most modern mines and metal producing facilities. They're going to be fully automated. And I'll come back to what I mean by that. And they're going to have a small footprint, at least a much smaller footprint, than we currently have to live with now. Some of these operations, some of these mining operations, will actually be bulk underground operations. They will no longer be big holes in the ground. There will be bulk underground operations. And a lot of the, the facilities will be underground as well. So there will be very little surface impact and very little surface waste, which is the, the, one of the things that we currently have to deal with in excess. We will have increased selectivity. So instead of going through the cycle that we've been going through, it's not really a cycle. It's a trend over the last 50 or 100 years where we've extracted less metal from more rock. We're going to try and turn that around, and we're going to try and extract more metal from less rock. And this is not going to be easy, but it's going to involve technologies like sorting materials such that we select the material that's better and only process that rather than all the rest of the material that's not so useful. And we'll be undergo more leaching, and I'll come back to those concepts in a moment. I also think it's by 2040, we will be producing higher value products. And we'll be producing these products, in some cases, at the mine site itself. 
in some cases at the metal producing facilities. In the metal producing facilities, they will be taking our material, our ore and our concentrates, but they will also be taking urban ores, recycled materials, and they'll be treating them both in these same facilities and blending the two together to produce the, the kinds of products that we want. So we will be an integral part in 2040 of the circular economy. So just a quick visual here of what this is going to look like. So the picture up on the far left is an open pit. It's in British Columbia. Big hole in the ground is a copper mine. We are now moving, and this is a trend that's already happening, to a full understanding of what the variability looks like in the ground. So that's the picture underneath it. Underneath the open pit, there is a little model of an open pit where each block now is fully characterized in terms of its physical, chemical, and in some cases biological components and how it's going to behave through the life of mine processing. That will then go to an underground scenario where we'll be able to fully model in real time the geology and the processes that's going on in the mine, the extraction, the extraction rate, et cetera, et cetera, and that model will be continuously updated. And as I said, some facilities will go underground. The picture in the middle at the bottom there is an underground crusher at a mine, existing mine in Chile. So that's, that's not new, that's already existing. That's all I'm saying is that we'll be doing more of that. There will be more facilities that will be underground than at surface. I mentioned that we're going to extract more metal from less rock. The picture in the middle there, the front end loader, has got sorting sensors across the top of the shovel that allows it to detect the concentration of the metal in the material in the shovel and selectively know whether it's good stuff that goes to the plant to be processed or not so good stuff and it goes to the waste pile. So this is real time sorting and it's being developed by a company here in uh, British Columbia. Top right there is, an, is a hydrometallurgical technique, a technology that allows you to, to, to take the concentrate from the mine and turn it into metals at a scale that can be done at the mine site as opposed to shipping concentrate around the world to different sites to turn it into metals. This is not going to be the whole solution for every mine, but there will be some mines where this makes economic sense and may, it may become amenable to that processing. And again, that's a, a BC-made technology, the Cecil Group, uh, uh, part of Tech Corporation. And finally, probably not by 2040, but now if we go a little further out, 2060 maybe, who knows, we will be extracting more metal directly from the ground by leaching. So we'll be sending solutions into the ground. The solutions will be leaching the metals from the minerals underground. We'll be drawing the solutions to surface and extracting the metals directly. In other words, no mine, no hole in the ground, no tailings, no waste, nothing. We do have a bit of an issue about how we're going to manage that solution underground and to make sure that it obviously doesn't get into aquifers or other potential potable sources or us us usable sources of water. But this is a, is a potential solution. And the picture on your right is a pilot plant in Arizona. So this is not so far from reality as you might like to think. So just to move on, what else is going to happen by 2040? We'll not only have technical innovation and technical success, we'll have novel partnerships. We'll have partnerships with First Nations and communities. In some cases, perhaps First Nations will actually be the owners of the resources and will be the providers of the technology. The, the alliances, the partnerships will be in the mining sector and the metal sectors, but it'll also be across a spectrum of other sectors that we need to work with more completely in order to tackle the problems that we're seeing. So IT, aerospace, transportation, biotech, genomics, etc. And downstream, we'll be working also with downstream consumer companies and sometimes in direct partnerships with them. So it's no coincidence, for example, that both Tesla, a car company, electric car company, and Tiffany's, a jewelry company, have invested in resources. We're going to see more activity from consumers going forward. Innovation and employment is going to happen because if we automate our minds and we're not employing people, we're going to have to find ways to create other jobs in other businesses in the communities in and around our operations. So that's going to require a lot of innovation, a lot of thinking about what that employment looks like and how it can use an integrated approach to energy and water that applies to our operations and also to the community and then deals with biodiversity, etc. And finally, in 2040, of course, the resource extraction will be recognized as an integral part of value creation in British Columbia. So just briefly to try and wrap this up then, what are the opportunities and challenges that relate to this, this kind of scenario, this 2040 vision for the, the future, the imagined part? So these are my three Cs, and these are the three most important things that we need to get our heads around. We have to collaborate, we have to partner for success. Unfortunately, in the natural resources sector, and this is a generalization, so don't shoot me if you disagree, in the generalization, this is not instinctively part of our DNA. We have to get over that fact. We have to recognize that to get somewhere, to get something, the big prize, you have to give up something. And that's a challenge for all of us who, are, who have come from relatively traditional companies and industries. 
We have to deal with capacity, capacity in all respects within our companies, but also within our partners. We in the industry have to take some responsibility for developing that capacity, for example, in First Nations. And we have choices. We have to make smart choices, and smart choices when under complex situations are difficult, but if we don't make smart choices, we're obviously not going to be successful. On innovation, we're going to see innovation between large companies and SMEs, other small companies, researchers, and the cluster concept, I think, is vital, and BC is well-placed to create clusters around our natural resource sectors. Digital transformation is going to happen. It's, uh, so we're already embracing it. And the key is to link that digital world into the natural world, that complex world, the physical, chemical, and biological world that we're going to be utilizing. The biological piece, the genomic part, is obviously immensely important, and obviously so already for things like forestry. But it also has applications in mining and mineral processing, processing as well. So we're going to see more of that as we go forward. And we desperately need in our industry a way to adequately scale models and have test facilities that allow us to put the technology at a scale that it makes sense for the kinds of operations that we have, the kind of scale of processing that we undergo. And that will require new investment, and that investment to date has been very difficult to find. And the last point I want to make here, it's, it's all about young people. Unfortunately, I'm looking around the room, there are not enough young people in this room, for my liking. I like talking to young people. They are, they are what gives me energy. Sorry for all of you folks. This is, it's, I'm as old as anybody, so it's... I love youth. We need to attract employees. We need to attract young people. We need to help educate them as users of our products and why our products are so important and can be developed in a clean and effective way. And to me, to do that, we need to tell the whole story, not only part of the story. We need to explain the whole natural resource story, and we need to get them involved in solving it. In other words, they want to have impact. We need people who will provide some impact. Huge opportunities for young people. We just have to tell the story in a better way. So, to wrap this up and conclude, the future, this is the clean future as I see it. I see BC being known as the go-to place for collaborative, clean, efficient resource extraction. It's known for innovation because we have found ways to collaborate and work together in new and interesting ways. We developed innovative partnerships to solve our biggest, biggest problems, both within the, the sectors that are represented in the room and then with many other sectors and many other people. And we lead the world then in responsible value creation for everybody, and we're recognized for it. So that's the vision that we should be aspiring towards. And if we do that, I would argue that furthermore then, that resource extraction will be integral to the new clean economy in British Columbia and elsewhere. So rather than seeing resources and natural resources as an adversary to the new economy or an alternative to the new economy, it'll be seen as an integral part that's going to lead the new economy forward based on our strength in an incredible natural resource sector. Thanks very much. So th uh, thank you very much. I, I, before I begin, I do want to acknowledge that we are on the ancestral, traditional, and unceded lands of the Coast Salish people, and particularly the Squamish, Musqueam, and Tsleil-Waututh First Nations. Um, thank you for being here uh, today. Um, I will lead the lobby to get the natural resource piece on the main stage next year, if this is an annual thing. Yeah, I think that's it's important. And, um, you know, BC gets forestry, BC gets tech. I was at an event with the Minister of Innovation yesterday, and they were talking about 30% of, of Canada's clean tech businesses are here, are, are here in British Columbia. Um, and uh, Forest Products Association of Canada, we, we represent a lot of those companies. The companies that I work with on a day-to-day -day basis, Canfor, Canfor Pulp, Conifex, DMI, Paper Excellence, LP, Mercer, Tolco, West Fraser, and Warehouser are all companies that, that work with FPAC, with my organization, and, and have a significant footprint here in British Columbia. Um, I, I, I do want to say that, um, you know, our forest sector, because I'm going to get into some of the opportunity, and there's real opportunity, but there are challenges, and I, I want to be upfront about that. You know, we, you need to be living under a rock if you haven't heard about softwood, uh, if you haven't heard about NAFTA renegotiation. Uh, the possibility of a border tax. Uh, I grew up in a forest community in rural eastern Ontario. I've seen the ebbs and the flows and the ups and the downs and the fact that in my home community we don't have the plants we once did, uh, but we also have some different players making different things than they were a while ago. So um, at a time that is challenging and we're no different than any other industry that has its challenges, uh, we remain focused on that transformational path and the opportunities that exist. Uh, and and, and we're seeing significant opportunity um, and, and I'm happy that Bill and Martin are going to be speaking later too because I think they'll go into some real specific examples around tall wood buildings, the ability to build more with wood, 
what that means for the environment and the economy and, and, and also the, the new bio um, energy project in Prince George, which got some significant funding yesterday from the BC and federal governments, which was excellent to see. Um, so uh, this is Canada's 150th birthday. Um, uh, this year is, is our birthday and, and, and our industry uh, goes back before that. We've been builders in our sector of this country. Uh, you look at the railway, you look at the war effort that, that, that our industry supported. Um, you know, but the background, in, in, it was Vancouver Island, 1953, the first forestry rig, which was well before Canada's birth, actually. So, so, so BC goes a long way back uh, in terms of forestry. And, and we've come a long way in terms of the technologies uh, and the opportunities that are being presented in, in, in communities, the opportunities in terms of how we can better manage our forests, um, how we can, we can innovate and, 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 and run more efficient mills better supply chains and, 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 and the products that we make. So just by way of a snapshot, our, our industry right now, 230,000 direct jobs in Canada, in our sector, um, just about a million indirect jobs operating in over 200 forest communities where, and I, I've traveled you know, from Nakawek, New Brunswick to, to, to Prince George and, and, and communities in between, and I see how critical, I was in Peace River, Alberta, I'm telling you, after the, some of the challenges in oil and gas, if that DMI mill employing about 500 people wasn't in Peace River, I don't know what would be in Peace River. So it's not lost on me being a rural Ontarian and somebody who's traveled uh, the country to see how important. So I have an additional bit of pride and responsibility, I feel, in, 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 in the sector because those jobs are important to those communities and they're environmentally friendly jobs. And that's, that's I'm on my way to Whistler tonight because the Federation of Canadian Municipalities, a, a number of urban municipal leaders uh, from cities like Vancouver and Edmonton and Ottawa and St. John, New Brunswick are going to be meeting. And my job uh, on behalf of, the, of our companies in those communities is to bring that benefit message to big cities because uh, folks in rural and smaller communities tend to have a better understanding. I'll be holding that thing all, all day here. Um, before, we, um, before I get into some of the climate change opportunity, I want to do a bit of a level set. So this is a, this is a graph from Natural Resources Canada. Uh, which basically profiles the Canadian forest. And, and, and if you look at the 0.72 um, data point, uh, 0.72 million hectares, that's how much was actually harvested uh, in 2014. So that gives you a sense as for scale how much, you know, how fortunate we are with the, with the supply of, of, of wood fiber that we have in this country. Um, and it's, it's absolutely critical that we continue to manage and be good stewards of that. Um, and we are one of the few businesses in this country that plans in 80 to 100 year business cycles. 90% uh, of what we harvest is on crown land, which means provincial government sets the rules and the, and, 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 and the way that you're gonna play the game. So it's so very, very stringent regulations at the provincial level, equally at the federal level around protecting the ecosystems, managing species at risk, migratory birds, broader ecosystem management. So all this, I, you know, I was talking to one of my board members uh, uh, and he was doing a woodlands tour with his team and, and, and saw a woman in a hard hat sitting under a tree kind of writing stuff down. He's like, what are we paying her for? Like, what is she doing? Oh, you know, at this time of the day, we're trying to, we're trying to hear what types of birds are in this area and this goes into our planning in terms of where, you know, what we're gonna be doing next. And that's just one small example of many things that are going on day to day in Canada's forests and I would challenge you to find forest practices like that in places like Russia and Indonesia so so you know I, I think it's really important uh, that, that that we have a sense of, of the amount of responsibility our industry takes in for sustainable forest management and, and and the benefits that sustainable forest management can bring not only to the environment but also to the economy um, we also have uh, the 166 million hectares uh, independently certified forests. That's a, that's a world leading fact. Uh, and for every tree that's harvested in Canada, it's the law that that tree at least is replaced. So on average, it's about three trees are planted for every one that's harvested. Um, and uh, in BC alone, it was about 200 million seedlings last year across the province. Um, and if you don't believe me, uh, go to Google Earth time lapse, and there's a 32-year feature that can show you over any landmass area from 1984 onward where forests were harvested and the regeneration that's happening. Uh, and that's 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 a, that's a piece that I like to show to some folks who like to take the odd swipe at us and, and accuse us of not being not being sustainable. The last thing I'll say is if you look here, uh, 20.3 million hectares of forest damaged by insects in 2014, um, and then the fire figure, 3.9 million hectares of forest burned in forest fires. So 
that really dwarfs the amount of trees that we're actually harvesting uh, for, 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 for products. Um, that also is why we in our sector have long been climate change believers. This stuff is getting worse every year. And, and uh, so we have a, an, a, an additional interest in ensuring that we're doing our part uh, to, to mitigate the risks of climate change. We were one of the very few industry groups 20 years ago that said yes to Kyoto. Um, so we're not late to this climate change party, and I, I'm proud to be proud to be a part of a of an industry group that's that, that's been on the leading front of of, of environmental leadership and, and and the importance of addressing climate change. So, you know, and it's technology technology that's going to enable us to do more in this space. So we were back in May. So after uh, Environment Minister Catherine McKenna returned from Paris. Um, we sharpened our pencils and, and got to work to say, okay, how can we come to the table to help the Prime Minister and the government deliver on their commitment to meet the Paris Agreement objectives? Um, so we've, we were the first industry group in Canada to develop a, a, a broad strategy that would uh, introduce measures at, in our forests, at our mills, along our supply chains, and through the products that we make to bring to the table 13% of the government's overall goal. So 30 megatons per year by t annually by 2030 is the path that we're on. Uh, and it's a path that we're committed to and will be reporting out to um, as, we, as we go forward. Um, and as I said, it's technology that's going to enable that in terms of what we're doing in the forest, what we're doing at the mills, in the products, and through, through more efficient supply chains. So, so how, and, and I think Martin and Bill are gonna get into some real specifics on how. I'm gonna, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm gonna start by saying, we are an industry that's obsessed with using every part of that tree. If we leave branches and limbs behind, those are gonna rot or catch on fire, which means they're gonna emit carbon. So how can we drive value from every part of that tree? Uh, so, so, so after it goes to the sawmill, we can then turn it into a, a biomaterial, a biofuel. Can we extract the glue out of the tree and turn that into a bioadhesive? That's the focus. That's where the technology, that's where the innovation is happening in Canada and around the world. So at the mills, um, we've done a lot of the heavy lifting, partially through rationalization, let's be clear about that, but also through, through, through cleaner mills and, and using more of our residues for power. Uh, we reduced, uh, since the early 90s, uh, GHG emissions at our mills by about 66%. Um, we, uh, so so I, I wanted to put that, that, we don't see a lot of additional big savings or opportunity coming there, but it's an area we've got to continue to be vigilant and continue to look for improvements. The biggest opportunity is going to be on the wood product side, building more with wood, using wood more, because wood is less fossil fuel intensive to produce and to move along the chain and it actually stores carbon. And there are studies coming out now, Len Garris, the fire chief in Surrey, just wrote in the Firefighters National Magazine a week or two ago talking about the safety and durability features of building with wood. I know that's been an area where some anti-wood people have come out and spoken. And we're also now seeing some of the data from the UBC 18-story Brock Commons building we're starting to see some of the preliminary data that this, this is pretty cost competitive now too. And, and, and Bill, I think, might get into some of that stuff if he's gonna use any slides from his presentation from a couple of weeks ago. Um, so, so the products opportunity is significant. And, and, and when Martin talks about bio opportunity and, turing, and, and turing, turning biomass into, into energy, huge opportunity. But as I said, there's also biomaterial opportunities through bioadhesives, using wood fibers to make lipstick, um, getting to the nano level for applications in foods um, and, and, and from you know, jet fuel to airplane parts. So I, there, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of technology, a lot of innovation happening on the product side. The forestry side, you know, I was talking to uh, forestry dean John Innes a little while ago, there's a huge amount of work going on at UBC um, around, around more climate resistant trees. What trees should we be planting for, for, you know, if the temperature is, is expected to go to X in the next 10, 20 years? Um, how can we develop species that are more uh, higher yield, that are more pest resistant? How can we how can we maximize the carbon sink factor? So we're looking at about we think out of that 30 megatons, about 13 of that annually can come through even better forest management. So part of that is is just maximizing and making those trees better for tomorrow, um, continuing with the replanting and the regeneration above and beyond where we can. Uh, making sure there's a plan where we can work with governments to, to replant where fires and pests have devastated, like the pine beetle has in many parts of this province. And now, 
you know, the Saskatchewan government is, 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 is putting up money to help Alberta because Saskatchewan knows that that pine beetle wave is coming into Saskatchewan very, very soon. So, so a, a lot of opportunity for partnership here to support both on forest and, 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 and on, the, um, on the product side. In the clean technology space, so we had an announcement here yesterday, there was an auto announcement and a, and a, and a can for pulp announcement on, uh, and really happy to see the feds in the province step up. I really feel living every day in Ottawa, that I gotta get my elbows up a bit on the, you know, forestry is clean tech. There's all, clean tech opportunities in forestry. Everybody seems to think every other sector but forestry. So if you leave with nothing today in this room, forestry can equal clean tech in a big way. Um, and, and that's a message, and I was really happy to see Minister Baines here yesterday and, and putting, some, putting some dollars on the table along with the Clark government. Um, so last five years, about $1.5 billion has been invested in Canada in, in, in our clean tech sector. So innovation is in our natures. As, as I said, it's, 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 it's what we're seeing in the, in the labs, and, and this brings me, you know, once again to, to the people that are making this happen. Um, and we have almost as many lab coats as safety vests now, I would say, in our sector. It's, it's really something that's changed. And we continue to need those lumberjacks and those loggers and those people in the bush who are, who are doing a lot of the really hard work to get to, to, you know, to harvest. The average age of that group in most regions of the country is probably mid-50s to 60. So there's a real challenge and an opportunity, I think, by way of rural jobs for young people, for folks who want to work in the bush and, 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 and seize those job opportunities. But we're also increasingly seeing the MSCs and PhDs and, 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 and work in the clean tech space and in the biomaterial space and a lot more, as I said, lab coats in addition to the safety vests. And I think if I go back to that woman who was sitting under that tree in northern Alberta with a hard hat on, you know, we are inherently a green group. And I, I'm really struck by that when I go to our mills and I meet our woodlands operators out there how about how environmentally conscious they are. Um, and I think that's a real secret weapon and, and really, really important uh, to our sector. Um, the other thing, you know, our, uh, about 80% of Indigenous communities in Canada live where we operate or near where we operate significant opportunity about 1400 aboriginal businesses do work with us um, you know i've seen a number of joint logging ventures and joint ventures happening in our industry and, and we're seeing the same thing in mining and other industries there, there is more opportunity to, to do more there so so how we're working is also evolving uh, in terms of those partnerships on the grounds with indigenous peoples and i think the truth and reconciliation commission report has been a call to action for a lot of us to work together and try to do better uh, and I know in our sector we take that very seriously. So, you know, it's been 150 years um, plus for our sector in Canada. Um, uh, every time we hit kind of a rough patch as far as the economy goes, we tend to come out the other side of it looking a little bit different. I think this is going to be no different in terms of the softwood, NAFTA, Trump, border tax, whatever. Um, but, but a big part of this, you know, and what I do in Ottawa on a regular basis was in talking to government is, you know, this stuff is going to be happening and we've got to work through this, but let's continue on the path of transformation in this sector. Let's continue to invest and partner uh, so that our forest companies and our forest communities can continue to evolve and thrive. So I thank you for your time and uh, I look forward to hearing the rest of the presenters today. Thank you very much. The first thing I'd like to do is recognise the First Nations, uh, whose territory that we meet today, but also the First Nations across uh, the Nechako watershed, uh, the Kitimat uh, and Kamano operations in British Columbia, uh, where we uh, are living and are working today. This morning, I logged onto an app that showed me how the operation was running uh, in Kitimat, British Columbia, about uh, an hour and a half's uh, flight and a 40 minute hour's drive away. I can see in real time uh, the, uh, the operation of the smelter and how the, how the team has gone over the last 24 hours. A couple of years ago, I was standing in a room uh, in Brisbane and I was able to see in real time how the operations were running in uh, Utah, Utah, Kennecott, Utah Copper, uh, how the Oyotoigoi uh, processing operation was running in Mongolia, uh, how the coal operations, a little bit closer to where I was, uh, were, were operating uh, in the Hunter Valley in, uh, in New South Wales, part of Australia. A few weeks ago, I was in uh, Singapore and I was with uh, 53 other general managers meeting with the Exco of Rio Tinto. And we were talking about how the uh, technology on uh, these phones, uh, by the way, uh, probably made of uh, our aluminium, Rio Tinto aluminium, 
the iPads, the, uh, the different uh, software that we have that connects us uh, differently across uh, the world as part of, uh, part of the Rio Tinto business. But actually, uh, also, the, uh, the change in the behaviour and the values of uh, the millennials and how that will shift our focus as a business. And so I'd like to take a little bit of time uh, to talk uh, about the story in Kitimat and how we've taken technology for aluminum that has been uh, uh, developed over many, many years, applied it into uh, to refurbish uh, and, uh, and transform uh, the smelting operation that we've had for the last 60 years and turn it into uh, the modern smelter that it is today and how we've connected some of those uh, other technologies and used them and more and more start thinking about our own approach to, to leadership, operating and managing the business of, uh, of Rio Tinto, uh, a global mining uh, operation. So it's great to be part of uh, the innovation uh, and, and technology conference. Uh, it is disappointing to see uh, a number of young people not filling the room today. Uh, I, uh, I found uh, some interesting feedback uh, from our people who are manning the store. Uh, a lot of those uh, people are actually saying, why is a resource company even here? Which uh, is interesting because the uh, technology that we've used has uh, been researched and developed using engineers and scientists' input, knowledge and experience to push the boundaries and connect uh, those technologies into, uh, from other industries into our operations in Kitimat today. Aluminium has quite a long history, as I mentioned. The theory was first uh, proposed in around the 1800s and it took uh, many years for two individuals, uh, one in France and one in the US, and it happened almost at exactly the same time, determine how to turn uh, aluminium uh, from uh, aluminium ore and from the bauxite uh, material that we find uh, in, a, in, a, in the mining uh, area, the bauxite mine. So Paul Haru was a French engineer and Charles Hall, an American student, were involved in the reduction uh, or the reduction of molten aluminum oxide using cryolite bath towards the end of the 1800s. We take bauxite from a, an operation in usually a tropical part of the world, say Australia, a Guinea or Brazil for example. Uh, we then take it to an alumina refinery, it's, uh, it's processed and turned into a white uh, powder and that's alumina uh, oxide. We then take it to a place where we get access to power, similar to what we have in uh, British Columbia. We pass electrical current through a molten material, so we dissolve that alumina uh, into the cryolite bath. We pass the electric current through it and we turn it into uh, aluminium metal. Since its discovery over 170 years ago, the reduction process hasn't changed. And this is one thing that's quite uh, important, I think, it hasn't changed at all. However, a Rio Tinto in particular over the last 30 years has spent a, a lot of time developing and improving and enhancing upon that technology that we've installed into the British Columbia Works uh, that we have uh, today. So BC Works has actually been operating for over 60 years. Uh, it, um, we, we've taken that technology, we've applied it, uh, we've seen that uh, our energy efficiency and our productivity uh, we've in, have, have improved quite markedly. In fact, from a greenhouse gas perspective, so uh, generation of CO2, uh, we've reduced the intensity by 50%. So a new technology, a new approach from our engineers and our scientists to uh, really stretch that technology has meant that we are able to produce one of the lowest greenhouse gas signature aluminums uh, in the world. The original business was actually constructed in the 1950s and at that time it was considered an engineering marvel. We took our hydro power from the Nechaco watershed and the uh, Kamano uh, power operations uh, to give us clean renewable energy. It provides a unique feature that we enjoy uh, today. And then over 60 years we've been operating that smelting operation, that power generator operation and provided uh, jobs, employment, uh, commerce and industry for British, uh, British Columbia uh, for that period. By spending $5 billion starting in 2011, Rio Tinto uh, were able to install that new technology in place using Rio Tinto's AP, so the uh, aluminium passionate technology, that uh, provides a stable, uh, balanced process, it reliable and efficient, the innovation uh, of one of the most, world's most technologically advanced uh, smelters. So we reduced our environmental emissions by over 50%. And that uh, innovation and that uh, new business last year contributed $339 million to the British Columbia economy. We plan to do that for the next 50 or 60 uh, years. You might think of aluminium as, uh, well, a car or a bicycle. 
We also see and we actually produce a high purity aluminum metal in our smelter today that goes into the aerospace industry, goes into electronics. While aluminium itself might seem like a fairly simple product, it's quite a complex one to produce. It's lightweight, it's fully recyclable, it's resistant to corrosion, it's a great conductor, and it has many uses. Uh, in particular at the moment, we're seeing strong demand from the transport sector. So every, t every kilogram of aluminum that finds its way into a truck or a car will reduce the CO2 generated by that particular vehicle by a factor of 20 over the life cycle of that uh, vehicle. And I would suggest that if you would like to improve uh, the CO2 signature of your vehicle, you should have a look and make sure that uh, you use our al al aluminium in that vehicle because it's also the lowest uh, CO2 signature aluminium in the world. In addition to these uh, innovations, what we see with aluminum is it enables uh, a number of other technologies and a number of other industries to really shift uh, the needle in terms of their, uh, their productivity and their offerings. So I've talked a little bit about iPhones, the computer industry, uh, wind turbines, electric vehicles in particular. There is no structural material available at the moment that uh, would substitute uh, for lightweight strength ratio in an electric uh, vehicle. So in, in uh, Rio Tinto, we plan to continue to invest in research and development. Uh, that uh, workshop or that, that meeting that I mentioned in Singapore, I had the opportunity to see a number of different technologies that are actually developed by other companies that we were looking at applying into uh, our particular business. So for example, virtual reality, uh, we actually had a model of the Oyotogo underground mine uh, and we were able to actually walk through that mine and look at uh, some of those concepts. In, um, in the Pilbara, we have 69 autonomous trucks that are actually able to move material safely, efficiently and more productively. Uh, we actually also have the Rio Tinto Centre for Underground Mining Construction in Ontario, which means that we can bring experts from the mining industry to Canada and see the, the Canada uh, mining, I guess, below the surface. Uh, Canada really contribute to the safe and efficient uh, development of mines and uh, mining operations itself. We're also exploring technologies such as drones, for example. The operation that I used to look after in uh, the northern part of Australia before, before coming to British Columbia, we were ex exploring the opportunity to use mines to do survey work uh, more often, more regularly, improving the productivity and our understanding of how the operations is running each, each month. So with Rio Tinto's experience uh, and we, by applying technologies, also looking outside of our business, we believe that we'll be able to uh, continue to see uh, Canada becoming a key uh, global centre for mining technology and operational uh, excellence. I think one thing that's really important to keep in mind is that to, uh, to, be, to be good, to be productive, uh, to actually operate competitively, we need to have a global perspective. And so that means it's regional competitors just as much as it is the competitors of the business. So that requires a uni unified and sustained effort from both business, government, uh, investment in capital, the education sector, uh, where do we see the, our, our employees, our scientists and engineers who are really going to stretch uh, the next uh, level of our, of our performance at BC Works um, so that we can compete for the decades to come. So I'd like to say thank you very much for taking the opportunity to, uh, to be here today and listen to uh, our discussion around technology innovation. I'm proud to work for, for Rio Tinto, a company that's constantly looking both internally and externally to see where the opportunities may be to improve our business and our operations. Innovation is our, uh, in our DNA. Uh, what new idea can we bring? Uh, how do we really challenge the paradigm that, we are, that we're sitting in right now to actually achieve the next level of performance? I often say to my team, it's great to benchmark, that's good, but you'll only be as good as the people beside you. How do you really challenge to take that next step uh, forward? So learning and collaboration is what the, the next generation is all about. Uh, they're seeking a safer, a cleaner society, one that uh, delivers to the populations where we, we operate. Rio Tinto sees itself as being part of that story. Thank you.